Right guys, welcome back to the channel and to this Tyranid Codex review and today once again we've got James. James, thank you very much for joining us. No problem at all Harry, pleasure. And of course James is one of our Patreons so if you would like to support the channel for as little as $1 a month to get early access to battle reports, uh, please check out the link below and of course you can also pick uh, the armies to play. So, in the last video we looked at the stratagems we looked at Warlord traits and we looked at Relics and High Fleet uh, adaptions. But in this video, we're going to look at the unit and how to kit them out, what works well, and what combos we can pull off with each unit. So, should we start with the most obvious one, James, the Hive Tyrant? Oh, one of my favourite units as well. <laughs> Incredibly versatile. Yeah, incredibly cheap as well. Um, just to literally is the jack of all trades. It, there's not any area on the table where he's going to do poorly. And I think that's the key to this unit. Absolutely. So, of course, you've got mobility in the form of the wings. Uh, the fact that he's toughness 7 and has a 4 up invulnerable save is, is beastly compared to where he used to be. Yeah, especially the fact that he's a psycho as well. He can have very decent um, shooting uh, weapons. And he's also got very good choices for combat weapons as well. Yep. So he literally excels in every area of the game, in my opinion. Especially when you consider what melee weapons and what ranged weapons you can actually take on him. There's a whole host of things, for example, from uh, heavy venom cannons to uh, twin devourers. But then if you look in a combat, you've got monstrous scythe and talons which are monstrous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, reroll one hits on twos with reroll ones to hit. It's nothing to scoff at, is it? Yeah, and of course, if he's armed with more than one pair, he gets an additional attack, which means he gets five attacks with them. At minus three, three damage. And that's, you know, that's no walk in the park. That That's pretty brutal. And... However good that actually sounds, I don't actually think that is the best combat weapon for it. Okay. okay. I actually think the monstrous rending claws are the most superior weapon you can put in a Hive Tyrant. But now here's why. You give up your reroll ones to hit mm -hmm. for rerolling failed wounds. That is absolutely fantastic especially and considering he is strength six which means you can go after higher toughness targets if you've got them free rerolls to wound definitely um however like um regular rending claws monstrous rending claws do something special on a six as well yeah it's ap goes to minus six and i can only and think of two other weapons in the game that do that uh, that you've got the Necron Doomsday Arc. If you run a Mephrit one and you're within half range, it goes to minus six. And is the Knight Valiant Harpoon Gun minus six? It's I think at, it may be actually. It's at least minus five, I know that. Yeah. Which, minus six AP, and it guarantees you with damage of three, whereas the rest of the uh, damage is only D3. But I think when you factor in the reroll failed wounds, I yeah. think on average you do you do creep more damage through. Yeah, absolutely. And then of course if you take um, uh, there's the biomorph. Is it? Uh, I can't remember where it's toxin called. Saps. Toxin sacks. Toxin sacks gives you an extra mine an, an extra damage on the roll of a six to wound. So that's a four oh, yeah, damage. It has real good synergy with that weapon. Yeah. Because, I mean, re-rolling failed wounds just gives you much more of a chance to see that, that, that six that you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're going against knights, land raiders, things that are toughness seven and eight. And that don't have an invorn in combat. Yeah. Just slices through them like a hot knife through butter. And here's the best bit about this weapon. It's free. <laughs> yep. Uh, and Monster that, are zero points, where Scything Talons, I think, are 15 for one pair on a Hive Tyrant. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think when you factor in the points cost, it's just a no-brainer to take yeah. Monster Swimming Claws. Definitely. And then, of course, with a movement of 16 with wings, 
he's probably getting into combat on turn one if you want. There's obviously a whole host of other things that you can do. You can advance and cast uh, Catalyst on him. Not Catalyst. Onslaught. Onslaught, yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's a stratagem as well. I can't remember off the top of my head. That there, there, there is a stratagem, however, you can't do anything else. Um, you can't shoot or charge for that turn. However, it will guarantee a charge next turn. Definitely. And, you know, like I said, moving 16, you're probably only going to need, a, what, an 8-inch charge then? And then if you've got adrenal glands for the plus Seven one, less, yeah. seven, seven inch charge. Of course, psychic powers, we covered the psychic powers. He's an absolute monster. With the movement, you can get him right up there and psychic scream stuff as well as smite. You can almost pick your target by getting into the right position with his maneuverability. I mean, a real strength of this unit as well, having wings, is that you can put him in reserves. And deep strike. So you don't even have to start him on the table. You can hide him off the table to negate all your, your opponent's heavy firepower. And you can bring him down turn two to cause absolute mayhem. Of course. And he's also got Shadow in the Warp, which is obviously if you put him where you want when you're deep striking, or even with the maneuverability, you can minimize the effectiveness of your opponent's psychers as well. Yeah, uh, Shadow in the Warp as. Doesn't seem like much on paper, but you know, throughout the course of a game, throughout the, you know several psychic phases, it, you know it will make a difference. Yeah, and of course, casting two psychic powers, uh, he's also got. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. His uh, synapse uh, is range eighteen. That is correct. Any any hive tyrant, including the swarm lord, has eighteen inch synapse, which is massive. That used to be yeah. a warlord trait in seven. <laughs> so. Hive Tyrant's are absolutely the go-to, and obviously you were seeing a lot of Hive Tyrants in the competitive scene until the Rule of Three came out. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're 143 points base as well, which I think for the amount of wounds you get on them, 12 wounds, toughness 7, 3 up armor, 4 up in vuln, I just think it is a, a fantastic uh, unit for its cost. Definitely. So, Should we go on to the, some of the guns it can take? Yeah, yeah, because obviously with the Twin Devourers, that's 24 strength 6 shots hitting on 3s, which, which you, a lot of the Tyranid army hits on 4s or 3s, but the fact that you can, you know, if you get within range of a character, you manoeuvre them into the right position, even with weighted dice, the likelihood is, you, as long as it hasn't got 2 up armour and more than sort of 4 or 5 wounds, you're probably going to be able to do a fair amount of damage to a character. In to me, I'll I see the Devourers as sort of like the best scream remover yeah. that two minutes have. So if you're if you're playing someone who has really good screens, the Devourers will just absolutely get rid of them. Um, and for heavy weapons, I think the Heavy Venom Cannon, I, I personally think it's better than a Last Cannon. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, if you do take the Heavy Venom Cannon, you can take the Miasma Cannon. Yeah, which is a free relic. Uh, if you take a heavy venom cannon, and of course because of his maneuverability, the chances are you're going to get within flamer range as well. Oh yeah, um, I had someone charge um, an assassin uh, into my tyrant uh, that had the miasma cannon, <laughs> and he was within eight inches. And um, yeah, he charged in, and I literally just melted him in Overwatch. It was yeah. so funny. Yeah, uh, it always wounds non vehicles on a two plus as well. So. Um, yeah, it was very funny. Very, yeah, very cool. The Venom Cannon is 36 inch range, Assault D3, Strength 9, minus 2, flat 3 damage. And for me, that's what makes it better than the, the last cannon. Absolutely. But as good as Hive Tyrants are, there's still a lot of other good HQ choices in the Tyranid Codex. A lot of people are running Gene Stealers for troops. And if you're running a Gene Stealer uh, as your troop, you're going to want a Broodlord. Yeah, the, the Broodlord is just absolutely amazing. Um, like Harry says, if you're bringing Gene Steelers and you're not bringing a Broodlord, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Gene Steelers, we'll get to them in, in a few minutes, but absolute combat monsters, especially in larger units, getting the extra attacks. You get your Broodlord within range, not only 
um, is is he there to obviously jump in and try and tank something and, and that's it, tank something, take something a little bit heavier out that your Gene Sealer's weight of dice may not do. He's adding one to the to hit roll, so all of them. What did Gene Sealer get? Four attacks in a big unit. Yep, four attacks in a big unit. Hitting all on hitting twos, on which is absolutely nuts. And then of course, if there's a horde of Gene Stealers around him. He himself is going to be, you know, very, very hard to get to. Yeah, that's because he's a character with six wounds. So he's, you know, very easy to hide. Yep, and he himself isn't even that bad. He's got movement eight, strength five, toughness five, six wounds. He's got six attacks, four up, save, and a five up invulnerable. So a little bit better armoured and tougher than a normal gene stealer. But the fact he can hide... You know, get, deliver him where he needs to be with your unit of gene stealers. He will mulch a character, yeah, uh, in, in particular Space Marine or Eldar characters, anything that's toughness 5 or less. Once you get up to toughness uh, 6 that you're hitting against, it starts to get a bit harder. But strength user, Monstrous Rending Claws, minus 3, D3 damage, and of course 6 is doing 3 damage. However, like the Hive Tyrant's monstrous running course, he also gets to re-roll his failed wounds. He does. So, yeah, I actually think the Broodlord is better than the Tyrant in combat. Um, but the Broodlord obviously can't shoot. Mm -hmm. So, slightly better in combat, in my opinion. He can get more damage through. Yeah, he, but, he, um, he, he definitely does have... He, he's got more attacks, so... And, obviously, he can hide. Yep, um, also he's also a Psyker, uh, can cast one power and deny one. So that comes in very useful, especially when he's in a, an advanced role. He's very good at um, dishing out a, a smite or a, plus a psychic screen if you use the stratagem. Yeah. But the big bad himself, the Swarm Lord. Lots of people loved him when he came out, and I can totally see why. Now, I remember in the index, the swords were, um, I think they were D6 damage, and they did get changed to 3 in the Codex. He's still, in my opinion, very good. The issue that you have is people see him, and people shoot him. Yeah, very easy to kill, unfortunately. I think for any any unit that you're paying in excess of 300 points, I think that should that unit should have a 3 plus in bomb. Yeah, that's what lets the swarm lord down. You're paying 300 points for something that is just as survivable as a regular hive tyrant, and that doesn't quite sit right with me. No. You know, you read the fluff, and the swarm lord is a bigger, badder hive tyrant. He should be harder to kill than a hive tyrant. I mean, realistically, obviously he's got bone sabers. You're not. You do do a mortal wound on a six to wound, but. That's only going to help against invulnerable saves. Realistically, when you look at the monstrous rending claws on a tyrant, a six to wound is minus six, three, possibly four damage. Whilst the bone sabers are a flat three, and granted the swarm lord starts at strength eight with six attacks, people see him and people shoot him instantly. Yeah, I think where, where the, the Swarm Lord does well is when he's actually in combat, he's very hard to shift. Yep, obviously the plus one uh, invulnerable save in combat, and then if you've got Catalyst on him and Tyrant Guard around him as well, very, he's very... Almost, yeah. he, he is. The thing that makes him get shot up very quickly is his maneuverability. He moves nine. Granted, that's still quick, right? But he can't get there on, you know, even turn two. If you're not playing the game well, he's not going to make combat turn two. And I just think... Unless he uses Hive Commander ability on himself. Yeah. So then he's all of a sudden going 18, possibly even 25 if you've advanced him a cast onslaught on him. But it's a bit wasteful if you're running gene stealers and you, you know you do it on the swarm lord you, you'd ra much rather do it on the gene stealers to double move them yeah absolutely so whilst yeah. his hive commander ability is good i just think 
you could take two Hive Tyrants for a little more than the cost of the Swarm Lord. And I would far rather take two Hive Tyrants. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. Um, especially with the new beta rules in the way that when you drop a unit in the same turn, you can't use something on them like Hive Commander or Warp Time. And yeah. I think that's seriously hampered uh, the Swarm Lord's um, tactical um, usage because it, it's, it limits him even more. So, yeah. oh, you know, you've just deep, deep striked in, um, say, a Trigon with Gene Steelers. You can't Hive Commander either of them that turn. And I think that has really, really stunned the Swarm Lord's usefulness. Absolutely. And like, like we said, for the point cost, I just... With all of the nerfs and, and things that are stopping him being as useful as he should be, I'd just far rather take two Hive Tyrants. Yeah, he, he definitely needs a point strap. So the next unit, uh, obviously the Broodlord kind of buffs Gene Stealers. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is the Tyranid Prime. Essentially, it's a warrior leader. Now, there's no specific model for this. And this is interesting, James, right, because... Any Cordex that didn't have a model, they removed the entry for. And we did, yeah. lo we did lose quite a few models from, from the Cordex. There is no specific Tyranid Prime model unless a new Warrior kit actually lets you build it. I think it's um, there's like an alternate way you can build uh, a single Warrior in the Warrior kit. Is it like the um, Neurothrop in the Zornthrop kit? Yeah, it's sort of something like that. Uh, there's like a slightly more spiky carapace with uh, shoulder pads, cool. but you can only there's only enough of that that kit to make one. Right. So I actually think that was intended for, to be the prime, but it, it is in a sense a a glorified warrior. Yeah, um, um, you can kit him out exactly like a warrior, so he's got the versatility of shooting, um, ballistic skill three plus. He's got weapon skill 2 plus, so he, he, like, like Jim said, he is a glorified warrior. But he's a bit of a leader for them, and because of that, he can give warriors plus 1 uh, to hit rolls. Now, it does say you can add 1 to all hit rolls, which also means shooting. Yeah, so 3 plus ballistic skill warriors is nothing to scoff at. Nope, and especially if you're running Kronos to re-roll the ones if you stay still. Oh, yes. The, the one thing that irks me about the Tyranny Prime is that he's 100 points. Mm. And it's like, well, for 100 points, the best weapon he can take is a uh, Death Spitter. I'm like, that doesn't sit right with me. I think he should be able to take a cannon. Yeah. But there's no options for him to take a cannon. And that, that seems a bit strange. Yeah. Um, it'd be a lot better if you could take a Venom Cannon. Definitely. Totally agree, because he kind of wants to be in combat, but realistically, six wounds of toughness, five. Yes, he has a three-up save, but he doesn't have the invulnerable of the Gene Stealer Broodlord. I would, yeah. you know, unless you're running warriors, which most people aren't for troops, because they're running Gene Stealers, I, I only see the Tyranid Prime and, and a, a big group of warriors coming out for more fun games. Definitely. Fun unit to use, but if you're bringing him in a competitive game... He just he won't make that much of an impact, no. and I just think for a hundred points, he's like, why isn't he a psyker? So yeah, that makes no sense. <clears throat> Even if he could only cast smite, yeah, like the um, Eldar Born singer. Yes, yeah, I, I totally agree. He should, at the very least, for a hundred points, be able to cast a smite. Yeah. The next one that we're going to look at is the big mama herself, the Turvagon. My I word. I really, really love this unit. She got <laughs> tough. Yeah. Toughness 8, 14 wounds. Now, as a combat monster or a shooty base, she's not great. She's okay. Her ability shines, again, if you are running Turvagon, not Turvagons, Termagants as your troop's choice, as opposed to Gene Stealers or Warriors. 
Not only is she replenishing them, she actually uh, allows reroll ones to hit uh, for any termagants within six inches. This yeah, becomes um, very useful when you're running devil gaunts. Oh, oh yes, definitely, I agree. And the way it's worded is that only one of those termagants needs to be within six. Yep, yeah, and the whole squad gets it. Totally within. It's just within. Now, if you are going this route, right? And you'll probably agree with me, James. Things to do are definitely have, I would say, 20 devourers in a unit and 10 flesh borers. The reason that you want the 10 flesh borers is because you always want more than 20 in the unit to get your reroll ones to wound, which is a termagant rule. Yeah. But you always take the flesh borers as your chaff for the first units that die. And she can only replace flesh borer termagants. Yeah, and uh, you don't even have to pay any reserves, reserve points for them, um, because you're not. Uh, you only have to do that when you create a new unit. Yeah. But when, as Harry says, when you replenish a unit, it is totally free. So you are essentially the turbo on getting free troops every turn. Which is incredibly handy for backfield camping. Uh, keeping the the gaunts are kind of suited more best at mid range, but if you're running that thirty man unit of twenty devil gaunts and ten flesh borers, um, obviously rerolling hit rolls of a one, rerolling wound rolls of a one for while you're more than twenty, and let's face it, uh, sixty shots at strength four plus the extra uh, ten from the flesh borers is nothing to scoff at. If that's not enough, right? Use the stratagem to shoot again. Yeah, um, single-minded annihilation That's the one. does work very well uh, with that that type of unit. I mean, I've I've run fifteen fifteen, and it's slightly less firepower, but you're getting um, a more efficiency in terms of if they do decide to shoot at uh, your units. Yeah, you're not losing so many points. So, for example, if they shoot at say a twenty. Uh, squad of devil gaunts and a 10 squad of you know in the same squad of uh, flesh borers if say they kill 20 you've lost 10 devourers yeah. whereas i found with the 15 15 if that happened i've only lost five so my points have been spread out more better in other areas but there are pros and cons to both i, I just prefer a bit more balance that way yeah um Obviously, 14 wounds, very, very hard to take down. There is actually a relic as well that once you've taken a wound, increases your toughness by one. How does a toughness nine Tervagon sound? Yeah, that seems, that is insane. I mean, Laz Cannon's wound in an iron of four. Yeah. That's very silly. Uh, <laughs> and of course, good luck um, getting into combat with all the gaunts around her as well. Yeah. I mean, she's pretty tanky, so... There's not much that will annihilate her in a single round of combat. I mean, she has the massive sighting talons as well, so you have to be very careful if you do decide to engage her as her damage output is potentially D6 per wound. Yeah. Granted, she's only got three attacks and hitting on fours, but, you know, if you've got a reroll or two... Yeah, she can reroll once to hit as well because they're still sighting talons. Yeah. So, I think... What we're getting at here is pick your HQ based on the troop choice that you're taking for the army because your HQ complements your troop choices massively. Yeah, I mean, she's also Synapse and a, a, a Psyker as well. Yeah. So she can fill that role of, uh, like you say, backfield support. She's very good at buffing um, other key units. Because most people are like, oh, I don't really want to waste all this firepower on just killing something that's not very threatening to me. That's just replacing troops' choices. So I found that she does survive a lot of games because my opponent doesn't want to target her. They want to target the Hive Tyrant. They want to get rid of the Broodlord. You know, so on and so forth. Uh, the next HQ is the Neurothrop, and as I said, this can be built from the Zonthrop kit. Neurothrops were 
originally just like the sergeant of a Zonthrop squad, but they've got upgraded to a single model HQ unit. I really like this unit. Um, 70 points, and it is the best um, support unit in this codex. Yeah, absolutely. So for 70 points, you're getting a 3-up in run, 5-wound character, so it can hide, the Tsyka, that gets to re-roll ones for itself, that's synapse and of course it's got spirit leech a unique psychic power uh, each time a neuronthrope slays a model with the smite power you can heal a zoanthrope within six inches including itself because as the zoanthrope keyword exactly so a fantastic cheap hq especially if you are running zoanthropes again you know it helps buff the zoanthropes by giving the reroll ones uh, and to be honest, zone throbs are probably, I wouldn't say an absolute staple to most armies, but most Tyranid armies that you come across are likely to have at least one unit. Or at least that I've seen. Yeah, they're, they're, they'll either have a unit of zone throbs, or they'll have a Supreme Command attachment of three Neurothropes. You'll either see one or the other. Yep, so that's basically everything. Um, it, it's a very, very cheap HQ that's buffing your psychic distributors. Uh, and to be honest, if you want things to go off like um, Catalyst, Onslaught, things like that, you want to cast them on your Zonthropes so that you can re-roll the ones. But not just that, obviously the Zonthropes are hard to deal with because of their 3-up invulnerable. So if you want your psychic power still there to be able to use at the end of the game, you stick it on the Zonthrops. Yeah, you, you always put your most important, most integral power to your strategy, either on the Zonthrops or the Neurothrope. So, uh, we've got one more HQ to have a look at. This is one of your <laughs> favourite ones, James. Oh, big bully boy himself, I love him. <laughs> and that is, of course, Old One Eye. This thing is an absolute animal. Just 200 points of pure carnage. What I like about him in this codex over the index version was in the index, people was like, oh, is that Old One Eye? Yeah, shoot him off the table, bye. <laughs> in the codex... He's now a character with under 10 wounds, so you can hide him. And I've never really had a problem of getting him into combat. Even yeah. though he is slightly slower. Yeah, 7 inch movement, still decent. But you run him in High Fleet Kraken, you can get him places. Yeah. Definitely. So, I mean. Realistically, let's have a look at him. He's strength 7, so he's stronger than a, a, a standard Carnifex. He's got 9 wounds, not 6. He's got 5 attacks with monstrous cushion claws. He's strength 14. Yeah, he's, he's wounding literally even the most toughest of titans on a 3. Yeah. But then, of course, he's also got monstrous scythe and talons, so if you, 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 know, if you want to go higher strength you can or you can go for the reroll ones to hit and hit on your normal weapon skill that's what i love about him he's very versatile in what he can actually take on in combat yeah so he's got weapons to deal with um a, you know a fairly big size squad of infantry and or, or elite and then he's also got the the tools to you know carve open uh, a big vehicle or a knight Yep. Yeah, um, if that's not enough, though, you charge him in, and on a four plus, he does D three mortal wounds. Oh yeah, that's fun. <laughs> in addition to getting the plus one to hit, which means that your scythe and talons are then hitting on twos, re-rolling ones. Your monstrous crushing claws are back to threes. Yes, yeah, they are still hit on threes. However, because um, he also has the alpha leader special rule, he also adds one to hit rolls. Um, for all friendly high fleet carnifex and he also has that keyword so crushing claws 
are still hitting on twos. Yes, they are. But here's where I think his best rule is. It's called Berserk Rampage. Mm -hmm. And it says each time you make a hit roll of a six plus, which means it's susceptible to modifiers, you immediately make an additional attack with the same weapon. Which is just so, insane. With five attacks, the likelihood is you're going to roll one or two sixes. Yeah. But however, because of his uh, immortal battering ram rule, where he gets the plus one to hit, and his alpha leader rule with another plus one to hit, if you're using siphon talons on the charge, that six plus basically gets uh, modified from a four. Wow. Up to a six plus. So half of your attacks are going to re uh, generate more attacks. And with using Scything Talons, you're going to be re-rolling the ones anyway. So you do actually see about eight or nine attacks on average if you use Scything Talons. And if, you go, if you're using Scything Talons, you're going to carve open anything that's toughness six or less easily. Yeah, it's minus three three <clears throat> damage. Terminators, Custodes, everything. Primaris. Yeah, Primaris Marines. Even things like Imperial Guard Sentinels, you know, two wounds through, you're going to chomp through them. Yeah, um, I've seen old one I um, carved through a four man unit of Dragoons. Yeah. You only Just need to get what? Eight through? Yeah. And, uh, I, I don't yeah. understand why more people are not using him. No, he's, he's ex exceptionally good in Kraken. Um, and he also makes. The combat variant of the Khan effects incredibly good in Kraken because you're paying 100 points for uh, a Khan effects that's going to hit on twos, re rolling ones with six attacks. Yeah. Um, but he, he just makes Khan effects very good and he's just a very good standalone unit. For me, well worth the two, 200 points. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the next thing we're going to look at is troop choices. Uh, we're not going to cover these massively because obviously we have mentioned them as we've gone through the HQ choices. Um, Tyranid Warriors, though, are, you know, I think Tyranid Warriors are pretty durable. They're just not as competitive uh, as Gene Steelers. The toughness four with three wounds apiece and a four save. They're almost Primaris Marines of the Tyranid Army. Yeah. I mean, they're not bad. I mean, they're, they're 20 points base for a three-wound model with Synapse as well. Yeah. So they are the cheapest um, Synapse unit in the entire codex. So if you've got a few holes in, in terms of your Synapse web, they're a fantastic unit to, to fill a few, a few holes. However, any sort of game that's, you know, north of 1,500 points... They just get blasted off the table so easy, and it's such a shame because I actually really love the models themselves. I, you know, I, I do, I do like the the design of them. Yeah, I, I, I remember the old second edition metal ones. They were the best. <laughs> <laughs> they were really tall and gangly, weren't they? I, yeah. I, I think I remember. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty cool. But um, yeah, I mean, they're just slightly better than average. Um, soldiers basically you know they're totally crap all over guardsmen but they're only just sort of slightly better than a standard space marine so yeah. they're, they're, they're still fairly elite but they're not sort of on the you know the level of say a strike squad or um, a custode absolutely um, Gene Steelers are next of course weapon skill, Best, weapon skill yes. 3 plus Two plus there with the with the brood lord, one wound each. Um, but they do have three attacks and a five up invulnerable save. Uh, they do have a five up save, so that would transfer to four up in cover if there were. You only need ten models in the unit to get the extra attack. <clears throat> if that's not enough, yeah. though, the rending claws are minus one standard, and if you roll a six to wound, it's minus four. Let's face it, with that amount of attacks, you're probably going to roll a few sixes. Yeah, I mean, they are pretty reliable at taking out anything that's toughness 7 or lower. 
unless it's a Death Watch Venerable Dreadnought. Oh, God. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was literally the worst I've ever rolled. <laughs> yeah, Jim's um, charged 20 at uh, Artemis and a Death Watch Venerable Dread and did uh, one wound, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, one wound <laughs> for each unit. Just like, wow. Yeah. They should have um, both been dead. Gene Steelers are absolutely the troop choice to go with in a competitive scene. There's no reason not to take them at all. With how fast they are being able to run and charge, and then of course you can use Catalyst or Hive Commander and move them again, and then there's the Kraken Stratagem on top of that to move them again. Yeah, with, with Swift and Deadly they can advance and charge with no penalty. Yeah, we, we when we did that, we actually played Hammer and Anvil, and I deployed about four inches back from the line, and James still got the turn one charge. Which, that just goes to show, doesn't it? Yeah. Ne- nearly, I mean, I, I didn't seem shot the book with the, with the Swarm Lord, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, absolutely the way to go if you're going troop choices. Termagants... Um, uh, before we move on, always take Cycling Talons on them as well. Because they are a, a free option. Yep. So where they're useful is that against demons uh, that have virtually no armor and all uh, that have an inborn save, the Psyching Talons are way superior to Rending Claws. Allowing you to get least, more attacks really through. You, you just get more hits through. Mm-hmm. And to wound, the six doesn't matter against the demon's inborn save anyway. Yeah. So you just... In that scenario, you definitely want to switch to your Scything Talons. Um, but you do that on anything that has an invulnerable save greater than its armor save. The, the Scything Talons then are more superior. Yep. <laughs> uh, Termagants we covered anyway. Um, you know, the Ballistic Skill 4 Plus. It's a Toughness 3 critter with a 6 up save. Leadership 5. They, they are cannon fodder, they are your screen. But don't underestimate them like we explained with the Devourers. And their uh, Hail of Limbing Ammunition roll. Yeah, which so. was the re-roll uh, to wound roll of a 1. Get them within range of a Termagon. Uh, Tervagon means you, you know, you've got all them shots, hitting on 4s, re-rolling 1s. The Devourers are, and Flesh Borers are strength 4, so if you're going against Marines, uh, or even Guardsmen or Eldar, you're wounding on 4s or 3s, re-rolling the 1s, and then... Uh, total annihilation and shoot again. Yeah, I mean they are very un- un- unsung heroes, but I actually think they're the second best troop choice in the codex. Yeah. Um, Termagants for me are have won me so many games because when you bring three squads of thirty, some armies just don't have enough firepower to to deal with that, and then you just win on the objectives. Yep. Also, as well, you're, pay- you're paying four points. For something that's coming stuck with a strength four gun, that doesn't sound like much, but for a basic sort of infantry style unit, strength four is amazing on yeah. a on a weapon. Absolutely, hormigans. Oh. I want to like hormigans, and I love hormigans, and I've got sixty hormigans, but they 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 just become so expensive when you start giving them. Um, Adrenal glands or toxin sacs, and the kind, toxin sacs, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the two need, points of a toxin sac. They need them, but then they're just not worth the points. I, I, I've had quite a bit of joy with hormigans. I mean, I think just keeping them stuck is the best way to go. Yeah, I mean, their movement eight—that's pretty quick. The fact In that they're compiling six, obviously, with. Um, with Kraken. And Orc Consolidate as well, which is, yeah, they, they can really, really easily wrap around multiple units and, and tie so much stuff up. Yeah. And that alone has, has won me games where they haven't deployed correctly and I've really taken advantage of that rule. And, I've you know, I've had like five units tied up. Do you know yeah. what? In the Kraken uh, battle report that I did with the list that you wrote, I actually charged 30 of them. Um, at Ian's, uh, what's it called? The Primaris Dreadnought. Yeah. Uh, and because I could pile in six inches, I wrapped round him so he could not retreat. 
Dark Angels yep. have the stratagem that let you retreat and shoot. And then because they're in combat, they can't be shot at either. Exactly. And uh, granted, I didn't have synapse within range, but you oh, know, but with three or four do. attacks, yeah. he, he was only killing one or two. So, yeah. Um, or something really cute as well with Hormigants. Um, if you take them in uh, High Fleet Behemoth, there's uh, a really cute strategy called Brute Force. One CP. Uh, use this stratagem when a behemoth unit from your army completes a charge move. Roll a dice for each model in the charging unit that is within one inch of an enemy unit. For each roll of a six or two plus for a monster, inflict and one mortal wound. Yeah. So if you've got 30 Hormigants and you've literally wrapped around something really big, you could get five or six more wounds through before you even fought. Um, just a cute little strategy. Absolutely. Um, another one, actually, and I'd know, I painted these just for you, James. Ripper Swarms. Very useful. <laughs> and I forgot about them. <laughs> they're, tactically, they're very good uh, troops choices. Uh, they're the cheapest troops choice um, in the Codex at 33 points per unit. So it helps you unlock those, you know, battalions and brigades a lot easier. Yeah. And um, it, it's just a troops choice that can um, go in reserves, basically, that, you know, you can pop them up turn two or three and steal an objective because they're troops, they got objective secured. So, you know, if, if you're playing Maelstrom, I, I think they're, you should take what, at least one or two units along with you. Yeah. Absolutely, and of course, if you've shoved all your army further up the field, these can pop up at the back, and they're probably not going to get shot and score you a couple of objectives. Yeah. Um, in, in the hands of a clever player, very good unit indeed. Definitely. I think, however, where the Tuna Codex shines is the elite choices. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, Tyrant Guard are the first one and you don't see these that often but you pull a little combo off with your walk and hive tyrant and your tyrant guard and, and warlord traits and stuff don't you you do yeah um that is the uh the extra toughness was it you're saying no no the, the, yeah the damage yeah i know what you're on about the warlord trait where you take a wound uh the next phase afterwards any damage done to your warlords is reduced by one. So what you do is anything that's like one damage, you just take on your hive tyrant, and then any of the big damage, you let your tyrant guard intercept on a two plus, and they take the hit and convert that damage into one mortal wound. So they really do make your hive tyrant or swarm lord really survivable. The then you, you, you should... always hit the, uh, the warlord trait or the relic that's minus one to hit as well. Yeah, that further makes your warlord harder to kill. Uh, um, I only I only do that on a, a warlord that I can't hide. So if I'm making a hive time at the warlord, I, I usually do that combination of minus one to hit with minus one damage after it's been wounded. Yeah, I mean they're not bad. They're not great. They're basically gun drones for a hive. To, uh, for, sorry. Yeah, basically. They're, yeah, they're like tower drones, aren't they? Yeah. Um, However, shield wall is, I think, worded slightly different than the the, um, the greater. What's the tell? Save your protocol. Yeah, basically, um, you roll, be you roll before the um, before the save is made. Yeah. Uh, Whereas shield wall is done afterwards, so it is a superior rule. Mm -hmm. However, you you're paying a premium to get that rule on tyrant guard themselves. I th I just think they need to be a bit cheaper. I mean, you're paying, I think, over 100 points for three. Yeah. It's a bit steep. Yeah, unless you're playing big games, I don't think you'll see them that often. Oh, it's really funny when um, you're, you know, someone from your local gaming group puts uh, a Necron pylon on the table and they want to, you know, send your Hive Tyrant to Oblivion and it's like, okay, all that damage gets turned to one mortal wound. That's just props. <laughs> I don't think it, I don't think it is you know based on the wound because each time the hive tyrant loses a wound, 
So you would work out the damage against the Hive Tyrant and then convert well, each one of them? I, I, when, when you lose a wound, you then apply the damage afterwards. Right. So whether the damage is 1 or D6, you've still lost a wound after you failed the, uh, the save. Right. So then after you failed that wound on a 2+, plus, you can then intercept that hit. So then they right. then get one more wound. That's what makes Shield Wall so so good. I mean, I've had I've had loads of people in my uh, local gaming group like double looking. Oh, that can't be right. And then they, they read the rule and they're like, "Oh right, you are right. That that's uh, that's really OP." <laughs> <laughs> well, Tau have access to army wide. Yeah, so, uh, for a lot deeper as well. Yeah. So I think on the balance of things, I'd rather have. Uh, the cost of like an eight point drone compared to like a hundred point unit. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Next though, I think the unit of the Cordex definitely needs some attention and that is Hive Guard. Only take these in Kronos um, in competitive games. I mean, bring them along in any high fleet trait, but if you really want to milk um the most consistency, the most efficiency out of this unit, you've got to, got to put them in Cronus. Absolutely. Rerolling ones, uh, and then of course use a single man annihilation. There's so arguments good. for both weapons, and I can see both points of view uh, for both of them. Some people love shock cannons, and I think the way the meta is currently, at the point of recording this with Imperial Knights, I think shock cannons are good. Impaler cannons are still very good because you don't need line of sight. So, and they're still wounding knights on a four. Exactly, whereas the uh, shock cannon is only wounding them on fives, but you are doing the mortal wound on a four plus. And I was saying to James actually before this as well, the the fact that the Imperial Knights have got Iron Bulwark for four plus invon, then rotate Iron Shields for a three up invon, you need the mortal wound out, damage output. And I think the shock cannons in a big unit of Hive Guard, for example, six, in Kronos, re rolling ones to hit, and then using single man annihilation, it, it's a massive, massive threat to where the meta is at the minute. And I think no, people aren't necessarily going to take this, but I think people are going to shift away from knights very soon once people click on and start building the majority of their armies to deal with knights. Yeah. My kind of thing with the shot cannon is that it's assault D3, which is good. It means you can move your hive guard and suffer no penalties. Um, but the range of the shot cannon is only 24. Yeah. And when you're dealing with knights, you know, a savvy player will be like, okay, that's a very dangerous unit to my knights. So I'm just going to sit back and shoot you with my uh, rapid fire battle cannon or, you know, the massive Gatling cannon, or you know, which have a, a greater range than the shot cannon. I, I just think that the Impaler cannon being 36 inch range, not lead, not needing line of sight, that if you deploy them correctly, you'll just see a lot more joy out of Impaler cannon. But there is a lot, a lot of ways to protect the Hive Guard. Obviously, stick them in cover. They've got a three up save then. Yeah, the toughness five as well. So. Uh, Small arms fire, they're, construct, they're quite resilient to. But, either take Venom Thropes, or a HQ, which is a Forge World choice, which we haven't mentioned, was the Malanthrope. Yeah, I think after the Florence spam list is now dead and buried, I do think every list should include a Malanthrope. Yeah. Um, it, it obviously went up in points in, in chapter approved to 140, but it's a synapse creature, it's a character, it's got less than 10 wounds, and more importantly, it protects your monsters as well. Yeah. <clears throat> the fact that it can't be targeted and it gives shrouding to all your units within three. Yeah. So I'm going to jump forward in the codex and have a look at the Venom Thropes as well. Now, Venom Thropes are a unit of three, toughness four. Three wounds with a five up save, but they are minus one to hit them. Which isn't bad. Um, your opponent must subtract one from hit rolls for ranged weapons that target high fleet units, excluding monsters, 
whilst they're within 6 inches of a Venomthrope. The Mananthrope's range is 3 inches. In addition, However, the Mananthrope has a, a bigger base. He does. So you, you do get much more of a, a circumference, uh, uh, even with that 3 inch bubble. It's a much bigger bubble. Yeah. In addition, your opponent must subtract one from hit rolls for ranged weapons that target high fleet monsters while they're within six inches of a Venomthrope unit that contains three or more models. Increase the range of both of these effects to nine if the unit contains six models. I don't think you're going to see many six units. No, I want to like Venomthropes, I really do. But. You know, they even tempted us with the they turned their weapons from damage one to D three damage. Yeah. But it's essentially an even weaker warrior in terms of durability. The and the do mortal wounds in combat. Yeah, on a on a, uh, on a five plus though. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I don't think the bad. It's just there's so many other elite choices that you're going to take. And the Malanthrope yeah, does the, Malanthrop the same thing just, as a HQ yeah. choice as well. <clears throat> yeah. I, I want to like Venom folks, but I just think they're, they're inferior to the Malanthrope in, in most ways. So it's a shame, really, but. <clears throat> and of course, the targetable. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. That's why I think the, the Malanthrope does the, the same job better. Yeah. No, it, it, it's. Um, 50 mil base, you know, on a 50 mil base creature, three inches doesn't sound like much, but it's actually more significant than you think it is. I think it's actually a 60 mil flying base, not a 50. All right, I, I got. Uh, I think I got a 50 mil on my one. No, I got. I got a flying base. Either way, it's still a pretty big area. You know, obviously, like the larger the base, the the more the more you're going to get out of your uh, auras. It's just the, the, na the nature of the how circumferences work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, zone throw-ups we did touch on. Um, I think other than what we covered with the neuro there's not really that much more that we need to mention. Um, other than, obviously, their own psychic power, which is Warp Blast. When the unit manifests Smite, uh, it can hit something up to 24 inches instead of 18 and it inflicts an additional D3 mortal wounds if the unit contains 4 or 5 zone throps, or an additional 3 if the unit contains 6 zone throps. That sounds amazing, but that can be really um, cost-intensive. Um, yeah. 6 zone throps um, is going to set you back 240 points for the unit. But then as soon as you lose one, you're then obviously starting to, to lose it anywhere. So I think the most optimal way to take zone throws is in units of four. Absolutely. I mean, while they're in a unit of four, you can cast a second psychic power as well. Yeah. Um, and you can attempt to deny as well. I mean, the the unit is fairly survivable. Um, I've used zone throws in units of four. And I find that that is 12 wounds that they have to chew through uh, that have a three-up invulnerable save. Yeah. I mean, imagine a, a squad of 12 Marines with Storm Shields. Uh, that can be quite annoying to chew through them. Definitely. You know, uh, and also, with the if they're near the Neuro Folk, they can also heal as well. And then, of course, we're rolling ones for the Psychic Powers, which is why we mentioned putting... Um, the most important and most valuable psychic powers on them because of how survivable they are. Yeah, I, I quite like zone folks, but I wouldn't take them in any more than a unit of four. No. I think that's the, the optimal choice. Yeah. A unit that we don't see much of, though, is the Malaceptor. Yeah, I've got one. I haven't built it yet. You know, I, you read the fluff to, for this thing and you're like, wow. This thing sounds absolutely amazing. And then you look at it. And it, it was never great in 7th, and it's still not great now. I mean, 
For example, psychic overload, instead of manifesting a psychic power in your psychic phase, the Maliceptor can unleash your brain bursting psychic tendrils. If it does so, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 6 inches, up to the maximum shown on the damage chart above. So at full wounds, 6 units. On a 2+, plus, it deals 1 mortal wound. But on a 6, it does 3. I mean, it's 172 points. For six, for potentially 6 mortal wounds. If you roll very well, you might get 9 mortal wounds if you're lucky. And that's if you get close and you're not wounded. You know, it it's literally as survivable as a Hive Tyrant. It's toughness 7, 12 wounds, 3 up armor, 4 up invul. Yep. Those are identical <clears throat> to a Hive Tyrant. And a Hive Tyrant's not even much but, more points and much more versatile. No, the Hive Tyrant's cheaper in mo uh, if you're not taking wings. Um, there you go. If you, yeah, if you don't take wings, the Hive Tyrant's cheaper. And just better, you know, because it, it can it, juice. He can, can fight better as well because the Maliceptor is only yeah. a weapon skill of 4+. plus. Yeah, uh, the Maliceptor is exactly the same in combat as a Turbogon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got the massive sighting talent, so it's the D6 ones. Uh, four, hitting on fours, we're rolling ones with three attacks. It, that, that, that's identical to the Turbogon, so it's mediocre in combat. Yeah. And pretty mediocre as a psyker as well. It's like for 170 points, I want, I want some Araman level. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Um, we've got two more elite choices before we move on. Uh, one is Pyrovores. And I really, really want to get Pyrovores. Do, do you know, you know what I like about them though? I don't like the price of them. They're about 25 quid each. So they're very yeah, costly to buy. What I do love, right, is they themselves aren't great. Toughness 4, 4 wounds, 4 up save. Okay. It's the weapon. Assault D6, strength 5, minus 1, 1 damage. This weapon automatically hits its target. So it's a, it's a heavy flamer, an assault heavy flamer, essentially. Assault D6. But it's range 10. Not yeah. 9, not 8, 10. Which means you can drop these in in a pod and torch everything. I can actually see a very good use uh, for this unit in Kraken also. Because you could advance it with 3d6, picking the highest, double it. Yep, and then still yep. shoot. With no penalty because it auto hits. You know, um, how many can you take in the unit? Um, three? I think it's three, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's up to three. So, you know, a unit of three of them uh, doing that little trick is pretty much guaranteed to um, get rid of all and any screens. It's also infantry as well, so you could do single-minded annihilation on it. Yep, <laughs> and if that's not enough, are you really willing to charge 3d6? Probably so, not. You Would really it, don't want to be in combat with these things anyway because they've got the acid blood yeah. and the volatile rules. Which means they're so doing they're, mortal wounds to you a lot. Yeah. You don't want to be in combat. I mean, volatile, um, you don't even have to be uh, in combat. It just says when they're within three, if it's slain. On a four plus, um, the nearest enemy unit suffers a mortal wound. Yeah. Uh, it can be quite cute, and then obviously acid blood. Each wound you lose in the fight phase on the roll of the six, they also lose a mortal wound. Yeah. So if you get them nice and close, their flamers are gonna, you know, tear a hole in their in their lines, as well as all the the acid that's just gonna come pouring out of them. Yeah, I mean, e even the Blue Angel Captain Slam with the um, with the an with okay. Angel's okay. wing. You aren't, even though you are avoiding the Overwatch, you will not charge him at these because they will still do the mortal wounds. Yeah, also something I've noted as well is they're the cheapest elite yep. in the entire deck at 38 points. So if you do want to get that brigade, they are useful for getting three of these to un unlock your um, 
your brigade cheaper. They are very good. I mean, let's face it, most people will have a unit of zone throws and probably a unit of hive guard. If you're struggling for points, stick a single pyrovoid in there because people will avoid it. Or they will shoot it down, and if they're shooting at it, they're not shooting at something else. Definitely. You know, it, it's there to unlock a slot, really, isn't it, for the, the elite section? Yeah. And it's 38 points of, you know, it's really efficient for its points. You know, it's nothing to scoff at. I mean, a load of people are using Hellhounds, I see in guard, yeah. and it's pretty much the same flamer, isn't it, except for the Hellhound one is 18-inch range. Yep. So, you know, and they're paying, what, like 80, 90 points for a Hellhound? It's a good unit. It's a really good unit. It is, yeah. It's also got acid more in combat as well. So it's actually <laughs> minus three. Yeah, that's not bad so at it's, all. It's, it's literally a power sword in combat. <laughs> that's minus strength three five. damage one. Strength five, yeah. So they're actually not shabby in combat. Two attacks, it's fine. I mean, 38 points. You know, it, it could quite easily take down a Primaris Marine on its own. Yeah. Um, you know, and in a unit of three, they're going to give. A unit of primary is a problem. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, another one that you don't seem to see is the horror specs. Oh, I love the model. Yeah, it is awful. Yeah. So awful. <laughs> yeah. The horror specs model is fantastic. So much so that uh, James gave me the spares from his, and I turned mine into a gene stealer called Basilisk. The thing that really annoys me with the Harris Fex is it was clearly designed as an absolute, like, the next level Carnifex. You know, it's a pure combat monster. Why is its weapon skill 4 plus? Should be 3. It, it should be 3 plus. Like, Tyranids, you know, most people would agree that, you know, Tyranids have always been renowned for their combat prowess. Why is one of your premium combat monsters hitting on a four? Why is it, why is it only strength seven? Yeah, it should be strength eight at least. Um, you're paying nearly 200 points for the thing. I mean, where is it? Um, how respects? Yeah, it, it's literally 198 points. I mean, fair enough, right? It, it regains wounds if it's lost them if you kill models in the fight phase. You can regain one wound. But that is almost it. Yeah, as soon as you... Any game I've put it on the table, it's just been removed turn one. And it's just because it looks so scary. Yeah. Even, so, though, even though with the Ravenous Maw, you're making D3 attacks each with each of your attacks, it's still... It's possibly four attacks, possibly 12. That's way too yeah. random. Yeah, it's, it's D3. That's what I don't like about it as well. What, why so, did why yeah, Knights get 12 people. stomps, but he might get 4 bites? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, with the Rapacious Hunger... No, sorry, um, yeah, Rapacious Hunger. I think you do get to make extra attacks with Shoveling Claws if you wound with Ravenous Maw. But... Uh, I, I don't know. The, the four plus weapon skill really irks me. Um, I think that's what lets it down, and it's 198 points. You know, uh, I, I, ju I just think it's an extremely overcosted unit and need, needs to be much cheaper. Yeah. Uh, there is one more elite action, and for some reason it's right in the middle of the fast attack the Red Terror. Yes. He's basically a character Ravener. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've never used Ravener, so I don't really know much about how effective the Red, Red Terror is going to be on the tabletop in this edition. I mean, I want to get Raveners. Uh, I'm planning on getting them next. But they, they yeah, are they are um, fast, and they've they've got. You know, reasonable attacks, but the problem is with Ravenous, you're just going to take Gene Steelers instead. Yeah, uh, I like Ravenous because they look cool. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love that step 
serpentine. I love that serpentine look the models have. I th- they're they're sort of like exactly the same as warriors in the upper body, yet their bottom half is like a small trigon. I see, just think see, that. See, look- if you're looking at that, what you need to do is look at Morathai and the daughters of Kian models who have a much more attractive upper half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they are good. They're basically fast warriors that are slightly yeah. less armoured. They've got rending claws and scythe and talons, or you can give them devourers and death spitters. They, they are basically fast warriors. They're like your assault marines. What I, what I really like about Ravenous is their deep strike ability. Yes. I think that what that's what sets them ahead of warriors, in my opinion. You're, you're losing your synapse, but you, you're gaining deep strike instead. Mm. And um, a little bit of synergy that I've noticed with Ravenous is that um, they are your cheapest delivery unit in the Codex. The uh, cheapest you can get Ravenous in, I think, is about 70 odd points. Yeah, they're 23 points base. So. Yeah, uh, seven, uh, 69 points is the cheapest you can bring in a unit. And in High Fleet Jormungandr specifically, um, you can spend one command point as you're deploying and you can bring any um, infantry model with them. Which is handy. So for 70 points, they are literally your, your, your cheapest um, delivery system, basically. And yeah. I, I kind of like that, you know... You could. Um, I've been tinkering with like thirty devil gaunts, um, bringing them up with three ravenous for one CP, and just blow the hell out of literally anything I want. Turn two or three, and then of course single man annihilation once again. Exactly, like that. You know, the tyrannosite. You know, can only bring twenty gaunts. The yeah. the trigon. It's not a very good unit. It's too expensive. Yep, absolutely. Ravenous, though. I think uh, in High Fleet Yormungandr, I think um, I would definitely like to try that out. Yeah, and obviously the Red Terror is basically a prime version of the Ravenous. Gives uh, yeah. Ravenous plus one to hit. But if he manages to hit with four of his attacks, right, then he can attempt to swallow the opponent. Roll a d6, and if the result is equal to or higher than the highest wound characteristic, of the unit, one model from the unit is slim. He's got to hit with all four, though. Um, obviously, he does affect himself, so he's hitting on twos. The problem I have with that rule is it says the highest wound characteristic, yeah, not the highest remaining wound. Yeah, there's so a lot. There's a lot of things in Sigma kind of like that as well. If you if he could say swallow whole a slam captain, so say like you've done a couple of wounds to to a slam captain, and he's got like two or three remaining, and you can just finish them off and swim the hole. You'd be a lot better. But what are some captain what has five or six wounds? I have five. Yeah, so, so I have to roll a five. Yeah. It makes it, it in, in, in Sigma, the tree lord, Ancient has the rule where you roll more than the wounds remaining with the Impaling that's Talons to kill it. Talent, yeah, that, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, the know. Star Drake... You have to roll greater than the wound characteristic, regardless of how many wounds. So if you're going against a Demon Prince or a Bloodthirster, you might have one wound left. But you can't roll more than a 14. No, you can't. Yeah, so it's almost useless. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, if I fight Lucy Stadrick, I, ch- I chuck a Bloodthirster and Demon Prince's arm. Because he, he's, he, he's not going to do as much to it. But there is other fast attack options. There's Gargoyles, which is basically a flying gaunt. Uh, movement of 12. Uh, second big strike as well. Um, I, I think gargoyles are underrated. Um, I've got 50 of the buggers. <laughs> I've, um, got, I've got tw- uh, 30. Yeah, I think they're actually... They're quite good. Um, they're very good at dropping down with a hive tyrant. Um, they're very... Like, I, I was playing a friend recently and um, I managed to surround... Uh, his venom with gargoyles, and I left a gap for my hive tyrant to get in. Yeah. And in that venom, he had a couple of archons and a um, succubus. Mm-hmm. All, all of them were like kitted out to the teeth, and I just charged in the hive tyrant, and they they had nowhere to disembark. 
So I, I, I slayed the Venom and the two Archons and a Succubus all at once. You know, they're very useful. Yeah. Um, the one that everyone takes, though, to fill out slots are Mucolids or Spore Mines. Very good. Um, very good units. Like, like you say, Mortal Wounds in this game is key. Yeah. And, you know, for 20 points to do D3 Mortal Wounds or 10 points to do a Mortal Wound, um, I don't think you can scoff at it, to be honest. But not just that, spawn mines yeah. are great, right? Because obviously if you d- deploy them 12 inches away from the enemy, you know, you, your enemy is going to direct a lot of small arms fire. I say a lot, but if, you, if you're putting multiple units down, they have to direct small arms fire away from your army to deal with them because if they don't, you mm. will move and then charge them next turn. Yeah, and you do uh, more wounds with it, so that they have to deal yeah. with them. They they absolutely do. They, they give your opponent a conundrum because it's like, okay, I either have to waste this firepower on a pretty weak unit. Let's face it, that won't award me any victory conditions because of their special rules. So, you know, um, it's all part of their living bomb rule. Spore mines and mucolids never award victory points in any circumstances. So they won't award first blood or scour the skies or anything like that. Um, and because if they leave them, like Harry says, you just charge them forward, and then half the squad has just been taken out to mortal wounds. Definitely. Um, another thing as well is why they're very good is that the way smite works. So you drop these in front, they have to then waste their smites on spore mines, which is really funny. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... I think we've uh, gone past the Lictor. Have we? Yeah, oh, so how, we are. how could we forget the Lictor and Death Leaper? My, my favourite unit in the uh, aesthetically in the entire army. I do love the Lictor. Yeah, Lictors are, are really cool. They're not bad models either. Just remember, they've only got a 5-up save and they've only got 4 wounds. So realistically, even if you deploy them in cover, 4 wounds of toughness 4 with a 4-up armor is not hard to chew through. Ah, they, they would have um, a 4-up armor, but they've got the same rule that uh, Scouts have. They actually get plus 2 to their armor when they're in cover. Right, so three up. There goes to three up, and they're always minus one to hit. Yep, and then of course, even with that, you can deploy them as well uh, and set them up nine inches away, and you can re-roll the charge distance on the turn it arrives free of charge. Yeah, so because of that inbuilt rule, I always see them wasted in High Fleet Behemoth. Yeah, because High Fleet Behemoth allows you to re-roll charges, but it's like, well, when you're dropping down a Lictor. The lictors give you that anyway. Yeah. So I always see lictors as a waste in high fleet behemoth. Mm-hmm. But um, they're very good at um, capturing objectives. Um, you know, and they're just a nuisance. Very good at hiding as well because it's only a single model. Yeah. So they're very good at scoring your line breaker as well if you play them cleverly. And wh- uh, whilst they aren't. I wouldn't say they're amazing in combat. They're not bad. They've got three attacks, hitting on twos at strength six. Of course, with rending claws. I wouldn't say they can kill stuff. They can fight for themselves. If you've got one or two marines left on an objective and you need that nine-inch charge, you're probably going to kill one or two marines. Yeah. But I wouldn't charge it into a full squad of them. See, the thing as well is that um, they can even kill one or two Primaris Marines, because they've got two weapons. Yep, the Grasping they've Talons got a, two damage. They've got a new weapon called the Grasping Talon, which is the, the very big claw on top of their shoulders. And that is a strength user, so strength six, minus one, flat two damage. So Lictors are actually fairly decent at um, carving up a couple of Primaris. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, we've then actually got Death Leaper. Um, who is basically uh, a named Lictor. He's got one more attack. He's got two more wounds. 
and of course he is a character um, which makes him harder to target uh, if you charge a character uh, sorry you, at the beginning of the first battle you pick a character from the enemy unit enemy army and death leap gets to reroll failed hits and wounds when he targets that yeah, character he's very he's very good at head hunting um, and anything sort of Anything that's better than, say, spy, generic Space Marine Captain level is a bit too much for him. Yeah. The same as the Solitaire with the Harlequins, obviously, even though he's getting reroll wounds if you take that relic, realistically, any, you know, even Space Marines are a little bit of a struggle for him to deal with unless you're very lucky, even with eight, eight or ten attacks. Definitely can be um, very annoying, though, because he actually has uh, superior chameleonic skin which gives you a minus two uh, yeah. penalty to hit him at all times. I mean, I've, I've charged him into Space Marine Captains that have the Power Fist, um, and then they're all of a sudden, they're minus three to hit. So a captain that's usually hitting on twos is now hitting on fives. Yeah. And it's just like, missed me, missed me, missed me. Yeah. Turn back around and just chomp him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, heavy support in the Codex. There's, there's absolutely no abundance of heavy support. There's loads to choose from. And me personally, I think there's three pretty good choices that I, I like to take with a few others okay. that, you know, are cool. But I just, I just I don't think they're really worth it. So yeah. the main three for me, James, the one that everybody knows of is the Exocrine. Absolutely. I mean... The Exocrine for me is definitely probably the second or first best heavy support choice. Yeah. Um, it actually comes down in points as well um, from the index. Everyone was amazed at that. I know. I mean, it, the index Exocrine was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then obviously with the added ability of High Fleet Kronos, they got even better. Which means you're re-rolling ones. Of course, if the model doesn't move, you can add one to its hit rolls as well, which means you're hitting on threes with six shots. But also, again, if it does not move, you can shoot twice. And at strength seven, minus three, two damage. It's six shots. That's 12 shots doing a lot of damage. But, and I'm pretty sure you can guess what I'm going to say here, James. It's only strength seven. Pathogenic slime. Three damage. Yeah. <laughs> it's Shoot, basically overpowered plasma, isn't it? Yeah. And of course, if you turn it in Chronos, you're re rolling the ones to hit, hitting on threes. For me, I, I just think with the Exocrine, the thing that lets it down is the strength seven. Yeah. But I look at the rest of the, the unit, and that is literally the only thing I can pick. I mean,. All right, it's not great in combat either, but if you've let them engage it in combat, you've done something wrong. Massively. Massively. I think if they'd said instead of shooting twice, you could increase the strength of it and damage by one instead of shooting twice, then you have that versatility. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see why they didn't give it the sort of like the same overcharge rule that the um, the big plasma cannons you can put on like the Lehman Russes where. If you roll a one, you suffer a mortal wound. Or the ion cannons of the Riptides. Yeah. You know, I think... I still don't think that would have make, made them broken. No, absolutely not. Uh, the next choice that we've got, though, is the Tyran effects, And he lost a point of armor save going from in seventh into this one. But he's toughness eight. Fourteen yeah. wounds, which is a lot to chew through. Um... He's it, very it's versatile. The same, uh, it's the same um, as the Turbogun. Toughness 8, 14 wounds, 3 up save. Yeah. Um, you know, the same as the Exocrine, like all of our really good gun beasts are Toughness 8. You know, they're really hard to sort of deal with. Yep. It's a bio tank, so it doesn't suffer the penalty for moving and firing heavy weapons, but if it doesn't move, it shoots twice. Again, why would you not put this in Kronos? Yeah, uh, I think there's three ways. Um, two, I'd say two ways you run this. I mean, 
I'd love to run the flesh borer hive, but it's just doesn't look very good. There is a thing to help out with the flesh borer hive as well, and it was uh, I want to say slimer maggots, which increases the to wound roll by one. Sports, sports bugs. That's the one, yes. <laughs> but you know, it's strength five, and it's just like okay, I increase wound wound rolls by one. It's still not. It's only really geared towards anti-infantry, and it's just sort of, well, we've got twin link devourers on yeah. uh, a flying hive target to do that job better. Yeah. I, I just think the flesh borer hive is just such a redundant weapon on this. The You're acid, either going to take yeah, acid spray or the rupture cannon, definitely. Absolutely. The acid spray is brilliant. Heavy 2d6, range 18, automatically hitting, and you get to shoot it twice. It's, it is that, yeah. Strength, strength seven. Strength seven. Why would you it not use this against yeah. flyers? Your opponent. I mean, I really want to take one of these along because, uh, especially to my local gaming group, uh, there's a few people with the Kalexus. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I hate that thing so much. I just want to run a Tyrant effects over to it and just go goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> the, the rupture cannon, heavy three, strength ten, minus three, d six. It's a Laz cannon. Shooting twice, you've got six shots hitting on fours, re-roll and ones, if you chrono. Don't insult the rupture cannon. I'd say it's closer to a um, neutron laser. Yes, apart from neutron lasers, minus four and automatically three damage. It is. It's halfway in between. It's brilliant. But like you say, with the, um, the weapon beast, it's mm. technically six shots. Absolutely. It, it can, that that uh, can literally melt the heaviest of armor if uh, you roll well. Yeah, there, I think a lot of people. I mean, I love doing this. I don't know about other people. An exocrine, a tyrant effects, and another heavy support in a spearhead with a malanthrope. Kronos. Yeah. I think if you go in the Kronos route in a spearhead, I think another uh, great choice. Is the Biovore. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Biovore, they're, they're, they're a little bit tricky to play, I think. But, uh, yeah. you hit your target just, and you're doing more uh, wounds. If you miss, you're putting spore mines down, and obviously we've already discussed spore mines. And interestingly enough, right, spore mines do not have the infantry or beast keyword. And do you know what that means for the meta? See that knight that's running over the top of everything? Can't run over a spore mine. Can't run over a spore mine. <laughs> so not only are you potentially doing mortal wounds, you're blocking knights in. And it's like you don't have to set aside reserve points as well to spawn these mines because it's part of the spore mine launcher rule. Yep. Um, and if you want to generate loads of spore mines because it's tactically beneficial to you in that situation, uh, it's something I do is that I move them half an inch. Or I just move them the smallest amounts necessary. And you minus one to hit. <laughs> yeah. And then I use um, single-minded annihilation. So I'm generating as many spore mines as possible. And there are certain scenarios where, especially in like a psycho heavy army, where, you know, something like Thousand Suns, it's like, okay, now here's four or five spore mines to eat, smite. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. There's no reason not to stick them in cover to get the three up save as well. And four wounds, you know, it's going to take a little while to chew through them. Yeah, I mean, four plus save in cover, I mean, that's a three up save, that toughness four with four wounds. I mean, they're twice as durable as a Primaris in that regard. Yeah. Um, also, the Spore Mine Launcher is 48 inch range, uh, one shot, and does not need line of sight to fire. So. You can hide them, which means you can't be shot. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, they're infantry as well, so you know, very good unit. I mean, they're fifty points to go, but it's just really good mortal uh, mortal wound output. Absolutely. So next up, we've got the Toxicrine. Now, I love this guy in seventh. Actually, he's pretty decent in eighth as well. He is. He is. Yeah, about 150 points, and I've used him a couple of times. 
Well, I've got him into combat a few times as well. Um, I've not been disappointed with him, to it, be honest. I think it's a fantastic no. model. I do love the model, right? But my really god, hard. them tendrils are so unpractical. I think if you're going to assemble this model, you, you must magnetize the limbs. Yeah, I, I, the did. <laughs> I, I, I did. I did. I and... looked foolish and I hard glued them in. And of course, uh, as uh, as as, really as per rules at the moment, if you can see the model, you shoot it, which is silly. But yeah. Um, anyway, under the rules for the toxic cream, toughness seven, twelve wounds. He's not bad in combat. He actually has a couple of ranged weapons. He's got the toxic lashes, which are range eight. Strength user, so strength seven to begin with, minus two, and D three damage, but. You can also shoot them whilst you're within an inch of the enemy, but also reroll wounds. Yeah, it's really good. Um, one thing about the Taxicreen as well is, for me, this is why it's actually better than the Harris Specs weapon school through. Yeah, why not? Brilliant. Um, also, as well, is all its shooting attacks. Um, Oh no, sorry, it's got one shooting attack uh, called Choking Spores. Yep. That also allows you to reroll failed wounds. But it also uh, negates all their cover saves. And like, all their bonuses to cover. And they're both assault weapons. So, I mean, he's only ballistic skill 4 plus. But you know what? He wants to be in combat anyway. There's no harm in advancing him turn 1. Get a couple of shots off. And, and you know, by the time you make your charge on turn 2. He's going to be a lot closer to a lot of units. Between all them, you know, two d six worth of shots, and then how good he is in combat, rerolling all them wounds, he's not going to be bad. But if that's not enough, he can protect himself in combat. He's not bad at fighting. Weapon skill three, strength seven, minus two, d three damage, rerolling wounds. Also, and the acid blood. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. The acid blood, and he fights first. Yes, he does, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how that would compare to, say, something against Slanesh, how that rule would work. It depends. But... It, it dep it, it's really, really fickle, because when we and Lucy used her Slanesh, uh, Z Zara Kniel has a special rule that says she always fights first, same as Mephiston, if he's your warlord. And I think yeah. if the rule says they fight first, they fight before any charges... But in priority order of who's the control and player whose turn it is first, I think. So you do anything that says it fights first, first, you'd alternate. Then you do your charges, obviously, maybe alternate with Slash, and it gets very, very complicated. Yeah, because it, it, it says it always fights first. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe that's something that could be clar you know, clarified in a future FAQ, perhaps. Yeah, um, another thing to note as well with the Toxicrine, I mean, even though the Choking Spores are only Strength 3, you get, like you say, you're getting the re-roll wounds, but the damage on all its weapons is D3. Yep, which is brilliant. Think, you know? And then its other weapons are minus 2. That's decent. He can, you know, there's nothing... he can take on most things. He can take on multi-wound things, such as Terminators. He can take on, I would say, lighter armoured characters pretty well. And even vehicles, you can have a, uh, a good go on. Yeah, definitely. Now, he's also got the hypertoxic miasma. So, at the end of the fight phase on a six, um, each enemy model within an inch uh, suffers a mortal wound. Yep. You know, just really, really good for 150 points. You know, I think we've got 153 odd. In, com no, in comparison to some of the other stuff in the book, he's definitely good. Yeah, 157. You know, he's he just he's just better than the Harrisbex. Simple as that. Definitely. Um, we mentioned old one eye early, one of your favourites, and Carnifex has got split out into three separate groups in the new book. Very specific builds for two of them, and then you've kind of got your customizable build of the standard Carnifex. I mean, realistically, all of them have got weapon and ballistic skill 4+. They're all strength 6, they're all toughness 7, 8 wounds. 
all got four attacks base, leadership six, and a three up save. It's the special rules that make the difference with them and what you can actually kit them with. So yeah. I, I think it's probably worth looking at the Screamer Killer and the Thornbacks first and then the standard. Yeah, they're, they're, um, there's less to them than the, the generic Khan effects. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the Khan effects that started it all. The Screamer Killer. Um, interesting thing as well, the Screamer Killer and the normal Carnifex both have living battering ram. The Thornback doesn't. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, the Thornback has his unique version. It's, um, it does like... Ram. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Screamer Killer was definitely like for the old school players, wasn't it? You know, his, his fan service. And there's, you know, what's not to love about that? Yeah, of course, you get the Bioplasma Scream, uh, Strength 7, minus 4, 1 damage, Assault D6. It's an assault weapon, which means you're running. You're still getting to shoot it. It's, you know, it's pretty decent. But... I mean, the mine was pretty tasty. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, it can take toxin sacks and adrenal glands, so obviously plus one to run and charge, or an extra damage on a six to wound. And it can take spore cysts, which means he's at minus one to hit him naturally. Worth noting, this does not stack with venom throps. Yeah, um, it's a shame, really, but you can't argue with the spore cysts because they're only ten points. Exactly. Uh, I think they're absolutely fantastic and. Nine times out of ten, you're going to want sporces on your Khan effects if they can take them. They're that good. Absolutely. Um, all Khan effects have monstrous brood, so you can actually set them up in a brood and then split them off. Which, bearing in mind with the new rule of three, means you can get uh, oh. 28 Khan effects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because um, there's also a forge world Khan effects. Oh, the Stone Crusher, so you can actually get. Uh, 36. 37 if you count all one eye. <laughs> I, I want to know how many points that could be and just have 37 uh, kind of effects running across the table in an apocalypse game. That would be really fun. Because you, you, you take three units of three kind of effects, three units of three screamer killers and three units of three thornbacks because they're all different data sheets. Yeah. And you can totally do that because guard players do it with the two variants of Hellhound. And basilisks. You quite often see nine basilisks, <laughs> which is horrendous. But yeah, anyway, Screamer Killers, um, that's what we're looking at. So obviously the Spore Cysts, uh, it doesn't act um, stack with the Venom Thropes. Your opponent must subtract one from morale tests if they're within eight inches. So, you know, it's a nice little buff. Um, yeah, they're kind of fine. Yeah, they get the, uh, the minus one modifier for morale. Yeah, but basically, um, basically he's re-rolling hit rolls um, and he can make one additional attack. So he's got five attacks, hitting on fours, re-rolling ones. He's not bad, he's fast, he charges, get him up there. And yet yeah, they're equipped with, the, like you said, the bioplasmic screen and two pairs of monstrous cycling talents. So that actually gives them an extra attack. Yeah. Which um, turn, you know gives them five attacks, hitting on threes, re-rolling ones on the charge. You know, they're, they're definitely, um, the unique thing about this specific um, Carnifex is the bioplasmic screen and the terrifying roll. Definitely. Everything else you can get on a regular Carnifex. Uh, the other one to look at is the Thornback, which is may probably the more shooty based one. Yeah, this this one's uh, very geared towards anti-infantry. Yeah, so of course he, he's got spine banks, which is an assault four shot, and you can still shoot it whilst you're within an inch. Uh, you can take death spitters, devourers, stranglethorn cannons uh, as well. So he's got a lot of options, but um, he can take the enhanced senses upgrade, which gives him plus one to hit. Yeah, so... He's, he's sort of like your, your shooty boy um, against screens, essentially. So, well, the Thorn Battering Ram is virtually the same as Living Battering Ram. 
Um, but instead, infantry units suffer D3 mortal wounds. Yeah. Um, and that's basically it. Um, he's also got the Monstrous Brood special rule. Um, and he's all, the Chitting Thorns as well. At the end of the fight phase, roll a D6 for each enemy unit within one. Any model uh, uh, within one. On a six, the unit suffers a mortal wound. So, you know, it's very similar to the Toxic Miasma rule. Yeah. Um, and then he's got the Vicious Hunter, which I think is the the, the, the rule that sets him apart from all the others. Ignores enemy infantry never gain any yeah, any never gain any bonus. And so of course that makes the devourers even tastier against Marines, because obviously Marines in cover with a two up save. No, they've got a three up save. I mean even the Stranglethorn cannon is nothing to be scuffed at in that regard because no. You, you get plus one to hit um, when attacking a unit of ten or more. Which means you're hitting on twos with enhanced sensors. Yeah, and it's strength seven, minus one, flat two damage. I mean, with the Vicious Hunter rule, you're, you're, you could target um, Primaris Marines in Ruins, and instead of them getting a two-up save, you've mm-hmm. negated their that, and you're minus one, so they're getting a four-up. So it's essentially an AP2 um, when targeting uh, infantry and ruins. And then it's a flat 2 damage. So, yeah, the Strangle Thorn on a Thornback can actually be quite quite useful um, at taking out Primaris or multi-wound uh, infantry. Absolutely. Uh, of course, you've then got the normal Khan effects, which basically is your jack of all trades. You can build them with what you want. You can mix and match your combat weapons with uh, your shooting weapons. Um, you can take chitin thorns. You can take the spine banks, the spore cysts. Uh, you can't take the enhanced sensors. Um, I'm pretty sure you can. Oh yes, yes you can. can. Yes. Yeah. Any model may have yeah one. Bioplasma enhanced senses, monstrous assassin more, or tusks. Yeah, you can take tusks, which gives them an extra attack. So obviously, if you don't want the monstrous side and tans, can they take rent crushing claws, rending claws? They can take Crushing Claws and Siphon Talents. Yeah, so I mean, even the Crushing Claws uh, with Tusks as well, you know, it, it's still going to do a lot of damage. So, the standard card effects is incredibly versatile um, if you don't I mean, want to run one of the specific ones. The way I run the combat variant is I take them uh, for 102 points. I take them with two pairs of Scything Talons, Spore Cysts, uh, and Tusks, uh, with a Bone Mace tail as well. So, Carnifexes also have tail weapons, so they get an additional attack um, on top of their printed attacks. So, with Tusks, you get an extra attack on the charge. With two pairs of Scything Talons, you also get an additional attack. So, your Carnifex will then have six attacks, hitting on twos, re-rolling ones with old one eye, and then his bone mace, which is a, a strength eight minus one in D3. Yep, absolutely. And then you can cha- uh, change him to a shooty um, kind of fix. I think the best way is to give him a heavy venom cannon. And a pair of twin devourers with enhanced senses. Um, I tend not to put sporesis on them because I'd rather save the ten points. Yeah. And then I'll keep them close to my melon throw. Yeah. The reason to put the the sporesis on the combat variant is because you usually uh, you want to march them forward as quick as possible. But yeah, I mean that that's like 125 points for that for that variant and. Carnifexes are like really cheap and they're very threatening. They'll either get blown off the table straight away or people will think, oh, they're not a threat and they'll ignore them, which is then, you know, a big problem for them. Massively. Um, I do just want to take a moment actually to talk about Stonecrusher Carnifexes because uh, I actually pulled one of mine apart. Uh, I bought the Stone Crush upgrade pack when I went to Warhammer World a few months ago. Um, and I magnetised the flail with the other crushing talon. 
Um, I still think Stormcrusher Carn effectors are good. They're actually, I think they're actually cheaper as well, point wise. Yeah, look, I think they are literally bang on one hundred points. But what you're getting extra with the Stonecrusher Carn effects is that you're getting um, a monster that literally does D six damage, and the Wrecker Claws do not give um, the minus one to hit. No. Times two strength, so strength twelve minus three D six damage. Reroll all failed wounds with this weapon uh, against vehicles and buildings. If the model has two wreck across, reroll failed hits against vehicles and buildings. See, I always, I think, I think giving them two pairs um, is probably better than giving them a single pair and a flail. I mean, the flail was brilliant against infantry. Absolutely, you get um, you make a number of hit rolls against the target unit equal to the number of models that are within two inches. So obviously, if you're going against orcs, you will absolutely use the flail. Yeah, definitely. Or guard, get rid of all the yep. the, the, the spins. But I think the reason you're bringing a stone crusher is to delete big things. Oh, absolutely. Tillamids already have an abundance of chaff clearance. And that's why I don't think the flail is as good because we've got stuff that can do that same task but better. Yeah. But rerolling hits and wounds against vehicles and buildings, you know, at strength sixteen. You know, uh, uh, strength twelve. You no know, fours, threes if they're near old one eye. I think uh, they also do D three mortal wounds on the charge as well because they're they're rams. If it's a vehicle or building. Oh, is it if a vehicle or building? Yeah. You know, but, you know, it, they're, they're definitely geared to be anti-armor, aren't they? And Absolutely. I think that's why we stick with them. Absolutely. Um, the, only, the only downside is is that they don't benefit from, say, something like Sporsis or Tusks or, you know, they don't get the bonus stuff that the regular Carnifex can. Yeah. But instead, they get a super-duper crushing claw, essentially. I wonder whether this guy could actually take a knight out. I mean, he'd struggle to do it in one go, because obviously four attacks and d6 damage, re-roll and hit some wounds. He's still going to struggle a little bit, but he's got a good chance of seriously hurting it. And realistically, if your point costed... I mean, three of them probably compared to a Crusader. Three oh, of three these of guys would maul a Crusader. Yeah, because that's three on a four plus. That's, you know, you're getting one and a half of them through. Uh, on average, so you know that's that's a good amount of mortal wounds, really. On top of it, absolutely. That's no. Carnifexes. There's absolutely loads to talk about with Carnifexes, and we could sit here and talk all day about them. But we've got big giant snakes to talk about, James. Everyone's favourite one, the Morlock. Morlock. Absolutely, <laughs> people love this guy, and. I can kind of see why there is the potential to disrupt your enemy's castle and do damage. Mortal wound damage. It's very inconsistent, though. I think the, the, what really hampered the Morlock was the beta rules. Yes. Not being able to come up turn one has really hampered this unit. However... It is, what, 104 points for a Mauler? Incredibly cheap. Like, 104 points for a single heavy support uh, slot. That's toughness 6 with 12 wounds and a 3-up armor. The thing with it is, as well, as soon as you pop that up in your enemy's lines, like the spawn mines, they have to deal with it. Definitely. They will turn their big... Like, I, I did it to, um, to aim with these Dark Angels, and granted, I forgot about um, the Space Marine strategy to let you shoot at minus one to hit with something that deploys. I forgot about it, because I don't use it. But, he had to shoot at that rather than the rest of my army. Yeah. I mean, the thing with the Morlock is that its combat weapons are pretty rubbish. I mean, in 7th edition, it had the benefit of being a monster. So it could still be dangerous in combat. Yeah. But in 8th, it only has the regular Siphon Talons. 
like literally the same surfing talons as Hormigans, which for me, it makes no sense, but it kind of explains why it's only 100 points. Yeah, I, I would have quite happily paid like an extra 30 points to give a monstrous scything talents. Yeah, definitely. Or at least um, give it the option to upgrade them. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, give, give them the, the, the option to actually be able to do something in combat, but, you know, you pay the points to do it. Um, but it does have um, options on its tail. It's got three different options. It's got the biostatic rattle, the toxin uh, toxin spike, and the prehensor pincer. Um, Ultimately, though, I don't think they make that much difference to the to the, to the model as a whole, which is I, I feel is a shame. A shame. It, yeah, it just I mean, needs that little bit more. I think the best one out of the tail, though, I think you're always going to go with the biostatic rattle. Um, it seems to have the best profile, and it's also free. And it's minus one to the morale. Yeah, that's what I mean. It, 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 yeah, it's minor, It's the only one with a, a modifier to AP. Yeah. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's got the modifier to morale as well. If, so and zero points. If it survives as well, obviously it can burrow back down and pop back up again. I think you definitely have to run these in pairs because if you take just one. And you just pop one up, it's gonna die. Yeah, it'll get dealt with. So I, I definitely think you need two. I think these shine though against things like say harlequins or demons, things like that have an army wide inborn save. Yeah, I think they're absolutely brilliant, and yeah, um, I still think they're competitive when used correctly. Definitely. Um, a funny little thing you can do with the Morlock actually is if you're playing on a table that actually has um, the Promethean pipelines or the uh, uh, barricades, mm -hmm. you can pop your Morlock, Morlock up um, more than an inch away to do the Mortal Wounds. However, if you're within two inches of them over the barricade, you're technically in combat. <laughs> because of the rules in the main rule book for Promethean pipelines and barricades. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, has um, that not been FAQ'd either? No, I've not spotted an FAQ. Wow. Or any, you know, the core rules state that if, you know, uh, if you're within, I think, an inch either side of a barricade and you measure from the barricade, you're, you're in combat. However, because of the width of the barricade itself, yeah. you're more than an inch away when you pop up the trigon. So... If you're a savvy player, you could you could really cheese them and then you know say pop them up next to some guardsmen and then attack them with seven cycling talent attacks. You know you're gonna don't, don't do that if you want to keep friends. By the way, <laughs> next uh, we've got his bigger brother. Yep, the Trigon. I, I, do, I, really I, I don't I don't understand the Trigon. I don't understand what it's there for. What, what does it do? It's supposed to be a really big call delivery system, but it's like the second biggest plastic monster you can buy from GW uh, in the tuned range, and it's toughness six. That you know, and you're paying 170 points for a, a regular trigon. I just think. Strength 7 and toughness 6, it just doesn't seem right for something that big. Yeah. Like, I've played them since the beginning of 8th, and it struggles uh, defeating a Lehman Russ in combat. Yeah. And it's like, really? Like, would a Trigon actually struggle plowing through a Lehman Russ? Nope. Nope. Like, and that's the thing, it, it doesn't live up to its grandeur. I remember seeing um, Ali, who's the guard player on the channel. Um, he showed me the old Imperial Armour book where they had mass points when the Trigon was originally a Forge World model. And, you know, if you find a resin one, good luck. Um, they were insanely tough and big and hard. They are basically what the Hero Jewels are now. Yeah, I know, yeah. 
I did hear something like that. You know, they they used to be a lot better than they are now. Massive. And, and that's the thing. Like, I think when you start paying upwards, you know, near and around the two hundred plus mark, you need something that's going to hit damn hard, and it just you know, and at least be able to tank a little bit. But the strength seven, toughness six for me is what is what's wrong with this unit. I mean, it's great because you can give it adrenal glands and you can pop it up. And it's absolutely fantastic in Behemoth. Mm-hmm. If it was strength eight, toughness eight, you know, I think that's what it should be, personally. And I mean, realistically, the prime doesn't even make it much better. You get an extra six shots on the gun. And synapse. And synapse, yeah, that's it. For 30 more points, it's just like... Um, another thing the prime gains as well, though, is it gains a character keyword. So you can give it some pretty cool stuff. You know, uh, if you run it in Kraken, you can give it the chameleonic skin. Um, but realistically, why would you when you're putting them on your Hive Tyrants and stuff? Exactly, yeah. And you can only take one of any relic. You know, uh, I, I just think it's their stat line that's the issue. I mean, they've got massive scything talent. You know, they can re-roll hit, one, uh, hit rolls of one and they do D6. So theoretically, they could be extremely dangerous because they've they've both got six attacks with their talons, no seven attacks with their talons, plus their tail. Yeah, it's just it's not enough. No. So personally, if they ever do um, anything like they did with the, you know increasing or decreasing stats or points costs in the next chapter approved. I hope they look at the Trigon and make it uh, fearsome on the tabletop. That's what I want. I want I want to be able to put a Trigon on the table and people go, okay, that's a problem. Yep. Much the same way someone puts a knight on the table and people go, hmm, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Trigons just don't do it. And it's a shame really. It's such an awesome model. Yeah, but we've got four units left to discuss, and one of them is a very fruity growth that I would not want as part of my body, I <laughs> the tyrannocyte. Yeah, I, I call it the, uh, the drop testicle. Yeah, <laughs> Lucy doesn't even know what it's called, she literally just calls it the bollock. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and she, she even painted mine for us, so thank you, Lucy. Um, Lucy, I, don't I'm know, that. I actually don't think that bad, and I've yet to use mine. You did tell me to use it, and I forgot to pack it. No problem. They're they're decent. They're okay. Um, I think they're about right, but you need to use them in the correct strategy. So, for example, you know, bringing down a swarm lord. You know, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, it stops your Swarm Lord getting shot up turn one. Yeah. Um, and they can also bring down any monster of 14 or less wounds. So, personally, I'll, I'm going to be using mine for my Dima Karen when I, when I get it painted up nicely. Yes. And that was my plan, but I totally, like I said, I totally forgot it. So, it, I, <laughs> it, w- it will be happening again soon. Um, another thing to do it on, actually, is... Shock Cannon Hive Guard. Yes, exactly. That's another um, way you could mitigate the the poor range on the Shock Cannon. And of course, you I deploy, mean, deploy the, you know, you don't want to be 9 inches away. Deploy them there, you know, 22 inches away in cover. Perfect. Yeah, um, and you can put all 6 Hive Guard in it. Yep. Because you, it says infantry of up to 20 models. I need to so, Hive Guard. Definitely. Yeah, um, their guns as well. They've got the Barb Strangler, the Death Spitter, or the Venom Cannon. So, and they've got five. Um, however, whatever weapon you pick, you have to have five of that same weapon. You can't like mix and match. Yeah. So you're either going to be paying twenty-five points for the the Death Spitters, fifty points for the Barb Stranglers, or a whopping hundred points for the Venom Cannons. Go with the Death Spitters. It's ballistic skill five plus. Shoot. Like whatever the gribblies are, whatever the screen is. 
You know, if you fight, yeah. if you're fighting orcs, guardsmen, tactical marines, Bob and scouts. Yeah. Bob Stranglers against those armies would be pretty funny. You'd be hitting on fours. Whilst I do agree, um, it, it's costly. Yeah, if you've got the, if you've got twenty five points to spare, definitely upgrade the Death Spitters if you're going against guard or orcs. Um, that you know, five d six shots hitting on fours. You know, that's 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 like. Better than the mortar teams, isn't it? That's 30 shots on average, which means 15 hits. Strength 5 as well. Strength 5 minus 1. So you know. 15 hits, 10 wounds, 7 or 8 field saves. So yeah, it can pretty much... Um, you could take a squad know. if you got lucky. Yeah, it's like a squad, um, either through lucky rolling or morale. So yeah, um, and there's not much to, to say other than that. Um, you set them up, um, and you set whatever you're setting up inside them uh, together as one drop. Yeah. Pretty much the same as any other transport. Um, how many points are they based, though? Um, 50 odd? Uh, 98 points base. So depending on how you kit them out, um, you know, 120 odd points to bring in any infantry unit or a monster of 14 or less wounds like that, you know, what's good about it is it's versatile in what it can carry. Yeah, absolutely. So next we've got the the flyers and I wish they were better, but they're so, so weak. What, the flyers? So what, the, the harpy and the hive crown. Mm. Harby, I, I think while he was a fast attack, was very, very good. As a flyer, I don't think he's great, and unfortunately, I haven't brought mine out much in it. I do, however, rate the hive crone. So that I mean, the move, the the movement of the harpy and the hive crone is both thirty. They're gonna get turn one charges. You can't stop it. Actually, I've just said that all back to front. <laughs> So, the Hive Crone is the one that I wish was better, whereas the Harpy is the one that's yeah, it's actually... The Heavy Venom Cannons, yeah. It's, uh, it's very good. The Heavy Venom Cannons are horrendous. They're so, so bad. I was on the receiving end of Phil when he had two, and it was just like Assault 2d3, Strength 9 minus 2, 3 damage apiece. It's, My... It, my, I've got a few issues though with the, the harpy and the hive crone, and it's it, it's very much a go first or you won't get the effectiveness out of this unit. Yeah. Um, also, it's toughness six. I kind of feel that you know for the size of the model itself, it should be you know toughness seven, and also four plus save on a monster. It's you no, know, it's a monster. Yeah. Four plus save. It's they're, they're really fragile and. You literally have to go first to sort of really get the points worth out of them. Absolutely, because as soon as the start, you know, as soon as the drop of uh, half wounds, they start only hitting on fives. And realistically, when you're paying good points for heavy venom cannons, you want them to hit. Yeah. I mean, granted, the harpy does have sonic screech, uh, which basically prevents somebody from fighting first. Uh, and then he's got the spore mine system as well. Basically, he can um, launch mines at people. Again, free spore mines. It's great. It prevents my armies, and your opponent has to deal with them. I do think the harpies are good, but as you say, they just paint a target on themselves. Yeah, I mean, they're not. They're okay in combat as well. I mean, three attacks. You know, they're not. They're not going to be amazing, but they could. They could. You know, take out Primaris. They've got something called Scything Wings, which for me is somewhere of a halfway house between the, the standard Scything Talons the Hormigans have and the monstrous Scything Talons. Yeah. You know, they're like they're, they're basically Scything Talons that are minus two AP and D3 damage, uh, and you still get the reroll to hit of one. Yeah. But I kind of feel that one of them should have been more focused on combat and have more attacks. But they've both got three attacks. It's like, well, the Hive Crone probably should have had more attacks. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the, the Hive yeah. Crone has tentaclids, which is basically here while missiles. 
So again, Hanley for taking out vehicles, but it, no, it's, it's not great at anything in particular. I still think the draw cannon is very good though. Yes, strength six, heavy flamer essentially. And the wicked spur as well, um, strength eight minus three. But it's only one attack. Yeah, um, it can just, it, it's just that extra attack that it can use to threaten, you know, toughness seven or lower the, sort of vehicle. The only issue I have with these is there is other things that work really well in the Codex I'd rather spend my points on. I think for how fragile they are, I think they need to be cheaper. Yeah. Absolutely. Or, you know, or give them the hard-to-hit rule that virtually all other flyers have. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, realistically, the move in 30 yeah. inches, it's not like it's like a, a Demon Prince or a Hive Tyrant where it's, you know, kind of hovering through the air these guys are flying you know my um my friend has a harp in and uh he was playing the game and it was like okay imagine the harpy you know see you know soaring for the sky and it got charged by terminators mm -hmm. you should not be able to be charged by things that don't have flood keyword as well no and that's also what lets the crone and the harpy down Absolutely. I, th I think, obviously, yes, it can move 30, but it does have the maneuverability where it doesn't have to just turn 90 degrees. I think it should have the option to be supersonic or hover. Yes, I, I agree. So if it's already in combat, then yeah, fair enough, other things could charge it. But it's like these Terminators got the jump on a harpy. Where it's like, well, that makes absolutely no sense. It should be yeah. up in the sky. How are Terminators charging it? You know, they didn't even have jump packs or nothing like that, but yeah. Um in Kronos I could see a use for the Harpy. Can't really see a use for the Hive Chrono if I'm honest. Nah. It's just, there's just so, other things that you'd rather take. Um last but by no means least, we've got the our only unique fortification. Yes. As far as I've actually used this, it's actually really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Keyword fun. I got very lucky with it, though, I must admit. Um, I brought it in a Kronos detachment. All right. And uh, I went ballsy, and I put five Venom cannons on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was scoring a lot of shots. Uh, I was definitely rolling above average on the D3 number of shots, and uh, I was rolling really well to hit as well. Mm. And then, you know, it's five Venom cannons. So, so yeah, I, um, I took off... Uh, the wounds of a pylon. Nice. Away, turn one. And uh, my friend was like, I'm still not going to shoot it because it's only like 180 points with the Venom Cannons or something like that. <laughs> he was gunning for my Hive Tyrant. Nice. Yeah, um, they, can, they can produce um, spore mines like the, the Harpy can, um, but they can either produce three spore mines or a single mucolid every turn. And it's got synapse. When it's in synapse. So this is a weird one. Yeah. It, has it, to, it yeah. works kind of like what the Kernoth Hunters used to work for. Basically, it's like an extension. So yeah, it, it's pretty good because you can... Um, it, it's basically another bubble of 12 inch of synapse. Um, I played this uh, in a more advanced role in the middle of the table. And it basically yeah. means if you've got some synapse 11 inches behind this, your unit that is 11 inches in front of it, 22 inches away, is within synapse. Really useful. Um, it also has something called a spore node, yeah. So it can once per turn produce three spore mandrels or a Euclid. And it's also um, uh, got a nine inch range. So it can shoot in addition. Mm -hmm. So any misses will then produce uh, three spore mines or a Euclid. However, you can't use it in Overwatch. Yeah. It would be pretty broken if you could. 
well, the the BioVars people used to use them like that in the index before they got FAQ'd. So obviously, yeah. oh yeah, Overwatch. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I missed. Look, I'm going to put some spawn mines right in front so you can't charge. And then even if you do make the charge, bang, bang, bang. Yep. <laughs> um, but obviously that was FAQ'd, so... Um, another cool rule about the Sporos system as well is it's the only... Uh, there's only two mm-hmm. things um, Timonids can use to drop down uh, before the game begins. So it is immune to the beta rules about being nine inches away. Yep. So during deployment... You can set up a spore assist in its hive ship instead of placing it on the battlefield. If you do so at the beginning of the first battle round, but before the first turn begins, and that's the, the key word there, yeah. the hive ship can launch the spore assist, set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches away from any enemy models. So essentially, you can really put your spore assist to sit on an objective in the middle of the table in a more advanced position. Uh, before the game begins, and then you can really um, hamper your opponent's ability to do that to you as well. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is the Meotic Spores have a similar rule. Yes. They're sort of like a, a halfway house between regular spore mines and nuclids. Uh, I actually have three. They are my uh, testicle. The, they are the testicles on the testicle launcher genes near the Colt Manticore I've built. <laughs> so they will be coming uh, soon if you're obviously watching this uh, pretty soon after release otherwise go and check it out if it's already here uh, yeah. uh, and another thing as well with the spore assist is even if you engage it in combat it's got like the same rules as any other fortification it can still fire all of its weapons as if it wasn't yeah so that's it for the Terminal Codex. There's a lot of really, really cool stuff in there. There's a lot of choices for Heavy and Elite, uh, and quite a few for HQ as well. So I, I think combined with the um, High Fleet adaptions, you know, a lot of units favour themselves to one or or the other High Fleet adaption. For example, the Heavy Support, the Exocrine, the Terran effects definitely favour Kronos. Whereas I think things like the Hormigans and stuff definitely favour Kraken. And if you've got a delivery system, Behemoth isn't a bad shout either. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of different ways to play Tyranids. They may not be as competitive as they were when the Codex came out at the moment, but they are incredibly fun to play. And a lot of variation in the lists. Yeah, I mean, they're the only army I own at the minute, and I've played them non-stop since the beginning of Oath, and I still enjoy playing them every week. I look forward to, you know, going to my local gaming group on a Sunday and, you know, putting whatever concoction I've come up with on the table and, and you know, just... It's, yeah, like Harry said, it's just a really fun army to play, and, you know, if anyone's ever thinking about getting to and it's just... Give them a shot. Definitely, and if anyone is interested uh, or wanting Tyranid advice, uh, please leave comments below. I'm sure James will be more than happy to reply. He's the Tyranid master, not me. I just, uh, I just enjoy building and painting them, and sometimes taking them for a run out. But yeah, I mean, um, thanks for inviting me uh, on to discuss too many of you, Harry. It's been an absolute pleasure. Not a problem. It's been, indeed, it has been a pleasure. It's been very enlightening for me. I've learned more because I learn by doing, not reading. So, obviously, this has been very beneficial uh, to me as well. Uh, I hope it has helped you guys just as much as it has helped me. Uh, and be sure to check out uh, Tyranid Battle Reports, which will be coming uh, to the channel again very soon check out the other video if you're interested in the stratagems uh, and the high fleet adaptions uh, but that's it from us once again thank you very much to james for joining us on the channel i hope you've enjoyed uh, having a look over my tyranny collection and uh yeah thanks for watching and check out the rest of the channel yeah no problem at all harry thank you